come and say, yes, God, you are worthy of all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. We are excited that we can worship you. We are excited that you are our God. We are excited that you are our king, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, your word says there is none like you in all the earth. Oh, we looked all over, but we found none like you. None can love us like you can. No one can deliver us like you can. No one can set us free like you can. No one can make a way like you can. No one can do us like you can. And oh, we thank you for it. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for being merciful to us. We thank you for being patient with us. A long suffering with us. Ah, we missed the mark so many times, God. We sinned. We've fallen short. But thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. Thank you for our do-over, God. Oh, we need it. We need it, God. Thank you. We bless your name. Not just for what you've done, but for who you are. Father, we lay the needs of your people before you. We pause to pray for our pastor and the loss of his brother. We pray for the family. We pray for Mother West. And we pray for Kevin's wife and his children, God. We pray for the family, God, that as they go through this season of, of loss and bereavement, that you by your spirit will come close to us. We, uh, that you will come close to them. God, so often we try to come up with the right thing to say and we try to come up with the right thing to do. But God, you know what they need. You know how to comfort them in a way that we don't know how. So Holy Spirit, go by that home. Go by that household and meet them, God, wherever they need. I thank you for the day that you said that you'll wipe all the tears from our eyes. And there'll be no more weeping and no more sorrow for the former things will pass away. God, we're sooner to, to that day than, than when we first believed. So help us to be ready. We pray for the sick among us. We pray for uh, the bereaved among us. We pray for those that are experiencing financial difficulties. God, you said the cattle on a thousand hills is yours, that it all belongs to you. And you're our father, we're your children. And you said that uh, uh, what father does not know how to give good gifts unto his children? So God, meet that need. Help that father that's wondering how he's going to pay the bills. And, that mother, how she going to put food on the table? God, send somebody by to meet their need today. To encourage their hearts. And to encourage them and let them know that you are there. Now, God, we pray over your servant today, Sister, Sister Kimberly. God, you, she drove a long way with a word in her heart. So, God, we ask now that you will fill her mouth that you illuminate her brain. And God, whatever she had planned to say, God, we give you permission to say what you need to say so that your people will hear what we need to hear so that we can be blessed and edified. Do something special for her today. And God, when we're finished, let somebody say yes to Jesus. Let somebody say yes, Lord. I will follow you all the way. But what good is any of this or all of this if no one comes to Jesus? I pray, God, that somebody will come to you today and give their heart to you. Thank you for loving us and allowing us to be your children. We bless your name. Not just for what you've done, but for who you are. And we pray this prayer in the name of Jesus, the one who is worthy of all the praise all the glory and all the honor.
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. And amen. preparing to come back to South this week to, to fill in for Sister Janine. I, I, I felt the Lord instruct me just to encourage somebody because it's it's been, you know, and we thought before the Delta virus came back, we thought, you know, we were in the clear and it was like that season's over, but then it came back and we find ourselves back in that place of just heaviness. Does anybody just feel heavy? Like the past year, two years almost, it just feels heavy. Then I, re- I was reminded in prayer this week for a spirit of heaviness. Put on a, a garment of praise. Amen. Y'all didn't hear me. For a spirit of heaviness, put on a garment of praise. What does that tell me? That when I'm feeling heavy and when life is weighing me down, I've, I'm staring at a pile of bills or I'm, I'm looking at a, at a doctor's report or, or I'm, I'm looking at all these things around me. I'm listening to CNN and what they're saying. I'm listening to what the radio is saying. And, uh, but I, how many in here believe the report of the Lord? And how many knows that for, for a spirit of heaviness, you can put on a garment of praise. You can wake up and, and, and ignore the noise and say, but today as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And in spite of what it looks like, you You can praise in advance. You can praise Him no matter what the circumstance. Because for a spirit of heaviness, you can put on a garment of praise. And let me just encourage you this morning. If you came in this building with a spirit of heaviness, praise is your weapon. If you're looking for a way to fight your enemy, whatever it may look like, praise is your weapon. And I don't know where you are this morning, honey. But if you're staring at a mountain, let me encourage you this morning. Praise shall be your weapon. If it's doubt, if it's debt, if it's depression, if it's sickness, praise is your weapon. This morning, I'll need 50 people to open up your mouths and give Him glory today. Let praise be your weapon. I'm tired of fighting in my own strength now. I'm tired of fighting it in my own strength. I can't get very far. But when I wake up and I say, Lord, I give you the glory. Lord, I give you the praise. That mountain will be removed. Those chains will be removed. In the spirit of the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, anything is possible. So for a spirit of heaviness, put on a garment of praise. Come on, give him glory. Believe it. Give glory if you believe it this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm ready for you today, South. I'm ready for you this morning. Come on, how many are ready to give Him glory and give Him praise because He's worthy? Hallelujah. We sing this song. Come on, sing. We give you praise. Lord, we give you praise. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord, we give you praise. Come on, have worship this morning. Give you praise. Lord, we give you praise. Hallelujah. Lord 
Lord, we Come on, how many came to praise Him for all He's done in your life? Oh, for all You've done. All you done. Lord, we give You glory. We give You glory. We give You glory, Jesus. Oh, for all. For all You've done. Lord, we morning he's worthy is worthy come on come on he's worthy is worthy come on clap your hands all ye people and shout unto God with a voice of triumph yes hallelujah Jesus hallelujah hallelujah Jesus come on let's welcome sister Margarita she leads us in this song I don't know about you, but this brother here, only thing that I can say is the all is on him. Amen. The all is on him. Amen. But I don't know about you, but I love the Lord more than anything. Amen. I love him more than my yes. spouse, my oh. husband, and I love that man. <laughs> but I love my Lord. I love my children. I love my parents. I love this church. But guess what? I don't love anything or anybody more than my Lord and my Savior. Why? Because nobody else would give his life for me. You can't help but to love him. You can't help but to praise him. If you can't, then I'm gonna give you a little bit more time to see. You can wake up on your own. Yeah. You're not providing for yourself. Come on. You're not doing any of that. So if you feel the need to get on your feet and praise him, please do so. Because when you enter into his court, when you get to heaven, I can guarantee you, you're not going to be seated. Not before the king, you won't. So what you do down here will represent what you're going to do in heaven.
anything more than anything I love you oh more than anything more than anything more than anything oh more than anything I love you Jesus yes I worship and adore you just want to tell you, yes, Lord, I love you more than it. Pick it up. Oh, I love you, Jesus. Hey, I worship and adore you. Just want Say it right where you stand. More than any, more than anything. How many loves it? I love you because you first loved me. I love you because you first loved me. In spite of all of my mess, you still loved me. Elder Bray, in spite of my past, he still loves me anyway. So I love you more than anything. Come on, as we sing this next song, we declare that the Lord is victorious. How many know he's, he's the God of victory, and he's never lost a battle? Amen. 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 How many knows he's tried and true, and no matter he's never lost a battle? Amen. Come on, sing this. Mm -hmm. Miracles when you move. Such an easy thing for you to do, and your hand is moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus, and your voice is calling me out. But right now, I know you're able, and my God, you'll come. Through again, you can do all things. Does anybody believe that? You can do all things, but fail. No, you've never lost a battle. No, you've never lost a battle. And I know, I know, you never win. Come on, we serve a God who's victorious. He's never lost a battle. Everything's possible by the power of the Holy Ghost. A new wind is blowing right now. Breaking my heart of stone, taking over like it's Jericho. And my walls are all crashing now. And right now, I know you're able. And my God, you come through. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You can do all things. You can do all things. But fail. No, you've never lost a battle. No, you've never lost a battle. And I know, I know, you never win. You can do all, you can do all things. Yes, you can. 
situation. I thank you, Lord, for what I didn't have to go through because your grace and your mercy Amen. built a bridge over it so I could just walk right over it and I can miss, I had to miss that season because yes. God in his grace and his mercy kept me. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Let's sing this anthem before we go into the word. You are Alpha. And Omega, we worship you, our Lord. You are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. You
We're out here just singing, worshiping. Come on, give it glory. sing that one more time just the voices we to be praised it I said is he worthy to be praised where y'all at this morning I said is he worthy to be praised I want to just take a second and introduce our guest speaker and I say that jokingly amen because Kim Watkins is not a speaker she is one of us she is one of us. I, I'm looking out in the audience and seeing Pam and my other sister. I, I had half a second of a thought. I said, maybe I should have them come up here and introduce the speaker because they know much better than I do. Pam and Melody and all you guys. It's interesting watching the journey of how God leads in a person's life. It, it really is. I remember when, <laughs> when Kimberly left here, she was teaching in the public school system. And I remember her telling us about the frustration. Then next thing I knew that she had read received a call to go to Wellington, Wilmington, Delaware, we get it right, to serve as a principal and a teacher in one of our schools. And now, 
God had a different plan and a different journey. The Lord has, in his wisdom and in his plan for our lives, has decided that, that she needs to go to the Seventh-day Theological Seminary to study the ministry, to sit under the greatest minds in our church to learn of God so that she could be a sharper instrument in the hands of God. I don't know where God is going to lead her after her visit at the cemetery, I mean seminary. Slip of the mouth, I'm sorry. I don't know if God's going to lead her to chaplaincy or pastoral ministry or, or whatever God has for him, but I just know whatever it is, it's going to be good. So I'm just going to ask all of her family, all her South member, Dashville members, to just stretch a hand toward Kim. Just stretch a hand toward her. God, your servant has come a long way to to bring your word. And we know that you have something to say. And so by the Spirit of the Lord, open our ears to hear what the Spirit has to say to your people today through the voice of your servant, Kim Watkins. As a matter of fact, I, I understand the proper term for someone that's gone to the seminary, you say, Pastor. Kim Watkins. Let's receive her this morning as she comes to bring us God's word. I travel with a lot of stuff, as you can see. as I unload. I have my shoes. I have my socks. So when, when, apparently, when you do this, you have to come up looking the part. But I, I appreciate the fact that somebody told me I was home, so I don't have to continue to act like I'm in the part. And so with that being said, I have to be appropriate and come up, at least come up in heels, but that don't mean I'm going to stay in heels. I'm going to tell you that right now up front. So if you're expecting me to be proper, I can go ahead and let you know you're going to be thoroughly disappointed. For those of you who know me, because this is family and this is home, I'm just going to be me, if that's all right. And so I'm going to let you know I'm going to be in these hills for maybe about five minutes. But I'm giving you a heads up. When you see me step out of them, I will be stepping in my flats, where I will be more comfortable to do what God has called me to do. Is that okay? I'm going to set them to the side so I can get ready. So... I need a chair because, again, I come up with a lot of stuff. This morning has been kind of crazy. I left my notes, and someone had to go home and get my iPad. And I said, okay, Lord, so what are we doing? And I said, okay, uh, the Lord was like, you know it. You know it. Don't lean on the iPad. Lean on me. <laughs> so I said, okay, we're going to see how that works out. So without further ado, um, we want to go back. I appreciate the song. I don't know who you are, but man, let me tell you, you messed me up. I was trying to remain calm, and I figured as long as I just sat there, I'd be okay to get up here and do the job. But when you came with the song, we give you all the praise and all the glory, I, that messed me up, and I, I, was, I couldn't do it anymore. And then it evoked a praise in me that just welled up. And so God is good. He is worthy of our praise. I don't know if you heard it, so I'll repeat it again. God is good, and he is worthy of our praise. See, because if, if I can just talk for a second. If Barack Obama walked in that back door, y'all would be on y'all feet, running him down to get an autograph and giving him praise. Am I lying? If Michael Jordan were to walk into this place, people's attention would be turned around trying to get an autograph and giving him praise. 
Do you understand? Do you comprehend? We have walked into the very presence of God Almighty who is worthy of every single praise. So let's act like we know we are in the presence of the Almighty God. So on the count of three, we're going to give God the praise that he is due, the praise that he is worthy. So on the count of three, join me and let's give God some praise. One, two, three. Hallelujah. Praise God. You are worthy. Thank you, Jesus. near the cross right in the cross in the cross let me hear you I hear Margaret I don't hear anybody else Be my sovereign that's right till what till what beyond can we sing that part one more time in the cross thank you Rodine I hear you I hear you in the cross be my what be Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech achulam, Ashir kiddushanu ba mitzvah ta vitzavano lehatetef batzitzi. And it translates, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us by his commandments and who commands us to wrap ourselves in its presence. Father, we are inviting you in right now to take over this space. God, we are asking that you would touch our hearts and our minds, that you would illuminate the word before us. God, I am asking in the name of Jesus that the, that the fire would fall from heaven. Consume me, oh God, with your presence. And we'll be careful to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory that is due your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I told you it was going to be about five minutes. I don't even think I lasted that long. So I need, I need, I need you guys to be like, give me a hand clap for that much, right? <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so I don't know if you guys like commercials. I like commercials. This is really loud. I don't know. This is like a lot of reverberation. Like, it's a lot of reverb on this. But I don't know if you guys like commercials. And one of the commercials that caught my attention this year was the TurboTax, the 21 TurboTax commercial. And the 21, the 2020 TurboTax commercial, I don't know if you've seen it, their motto is free, 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 free. There are about three commercials that they had. There are about three commercials they had. One was a, a, a lady that was a, it was a dog, a dog, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the dog pageant. And they had another one, it was a game show contestant. And they had another one where it was a, a guy, he was doing uh, aerobics. And the only thing that said in the entire commercial, they, no, no words, the only thing that said is free, 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 free. Free, 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 free. 
Now, I, I want to repeat the line from the song. It says, free to all, a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. So I don't know, if you're anything like me, can I just be honest with y'all? I, I like free stuff. A anybody else like free stuff? Okay, can I just make confession? I'm the chick that walks through, and when they have free stuff laying out, I, I'm like a shark. I'll grab it one time, and then I'll circle back and get another one. I'll circle back. I like free pens. Like, I would go to the gym, like, at, at, what, Planet Fitness, and I, every time I go, just because the pens are sitting there, I'm grabbing them because they are free. Just because. My car looks like a storm because I got free pens all over the place. Keychains, free. Love them. I get free stuff that I don't even need, but just because the fact that it is free, I take it. And if I got to be honest with you, pre-COVID, I, I love, I love like Costco. Y'all know Costco. Remember Costco? They have the, the free food, the samples, shark in it, and I go around and get my first time, and then I have to hide my face, and then I just try to slip my hand in because I don't want people to see me, and I'm like, she's been here before. Costco and and, and, and BJ's for the po people up, up in, in the East Coast. And uh, my favorite, my favorite, my all-time favorite, everybody knows, my, my friends know my favorite store, Whole Foods and Trader Joe's. Remember when you would go to Trader Joe's and they had out the samples? Now, I would get my first sample, and I would do a little bit of shopping. And then I'd come back and get my second sample. And by the time I finished, I think I had dinner. Because it was what? It was free. It was free. So free, free. Free to all, a cleansing stream. So my question is, when it comes to the gift of salvation, when it comes to what Jesus has offered on Calvary that is free, why won't people take that? When it comes to the free stuff, the, fr the best gift that you can get free is salvation from Jesus. So I scratch my head and I wonder, why don't people take that? We take free keychains, we take free pens, we take free samples, we take free things that we don't even not want or need. But Jesus is offering free salvation and he has to beg us to take it. So, I appreciate the scripture that was read this morning. If you guys would do me a favor and go back to Luke chapter 23, and we're going to read it one more time because there's some things that I want us to look at. There's some things that the Holy Spirit would like to, to point out to us. So you guys, when you have it, say amen. Then I have to give, take my own advice when I have it, say amen. Amen. <laughs> Okay, it's Luke 23, starting at verse 33, and it says, And when they had come to the place called what? They crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his garments and cast lots. And here's the line I want us all to focus on. What does it say next? And the who? Are you with me? What does it say? One more time. And the people stood beholding. And the people stood beholding. And the rulers also with them derided him saying, he saved others, let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God. I today would like to talk to you about the 12 who stood near the cross. Again, the title of the sermon, The Twelve Who Stood Near the Cross. And so, as a teacher, as a teacher, I, 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 I like to teach. And so, if you have pens and pencils, if you have papers, you might want to take some notes today. Because I would like to point out the twelve who stood near the cross. Now, you're probably thinking, well, we know the 12 disciples, but if you know scripture, if you are a student of the Bible, you know that the 12 were not there. As a matter of fact, you know that when they came into the garden, the 12 did what? They took off running. They scattered. 
And so let's pause for a moment. I'm going to give you the heads up of who the 12 are. You guys ready for the 12? Here they go. Number one, Simon of Cyrene. Number two, the soldier. Now, this is three and four. Three and four, they're the robbers. They're the two robbers, but we're going to give them robber on the right hand, so that's three. Robber on the left hand. You got that? And then the blasphemers. Next, they're one group, the priests, the scribes, and the elders. Got it? Then the centurion. And then all of his acquaintances, because that is actually listed in the scripture. It says all of his acquaintances. And that's also a subscript of that, those who followed him. The next, Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and finally, the disciple whom Christ loved. Did y'all get 12? So can we talk and teach? Can we move now? Well, let's get ready to fly. I want to start with number one. It is Simon of Cyrene. The Bible tells us it, it, that you will find it in, right here in the text. What I found interesting about Simon of Cyrene is that three of the Gospels, three, the synoptic Gospels, meaning Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all list Simon of Cyrene as being the one who was grabbed out of the crowd and had Jesus' cross placed upon him. John is the only Gospel that does not record Simon of Cyrene in the Gospel. He is the only one who does not mention Simon of Cyrene. And so I find it interesting that Jesus, that the Holy Spirit said, we need to acknowledge this man, not in one scripture or gospel, not in two, but in at least three of the gospels, we need to acknowledge the man, Simon of Cyrene. I'm going to give you a little information about Cyrene. Cyrene was a Greek outpost on the tip of northern Africa. Today, that would be known as modern-day Libya. And so scholars would say that Cyrene probably looked, I mean, that, that, that Simon of Cyrene looked like you and me. He was a man of color. But what is interesting to note about this, this man, this Simon of Cyrene, he is in Jerusalem at this time. The reason that he's in Jerusalem at this time is because Cyrene, although it was a Greek outpost, it was also a place where a lot of Jews lived. And so it would not be uncommon that Simon of Cyrene would make his way to Jerusalem because after all, they were celebrating the Passover. And so he would have been there for the high holiday. While Simon of Cyrene is walking through the crowd, the Bible tells us that that there's this crowd that takes place, and they grab Simon of Cyrene, and the word tells it, and they compelled him to carry. They compelled him to bear the cross of Christ. They compelled him. It wasn't like a suggestion. It wasn't like, hey, buddy, would you mind carrying this cross for, for the guy? No. It was one of force. It was one that was deliberate. It was intentional. They pull him out of the crowd, and he is forced to carry the cross of Christ. Now, I want to give you a little bit of information about this idea of carrying the cross because it's okay. You, you might be able to carry a chair from here to there. You might be able to carry a box from here to the parking lot. But I need you to really get your mind wrapped around what Simon of Cyrene is doing. According to scholars, Simon of Cyrene carried a wooden cross on his back anywhere from a half a mile to a mile. From a half a mile to a mile, this man, Simon of Cyrene, is carrying the cross of Christ. Can I be honest with you? Some of us don't even want to carry the cross of Christ while we, but I'm, I'm going to leave that one alone. See, we, we don't mind carrying the cross of Christ around our neck because it's easy to carry a cross around your neck. We don't mind carrying a cross on our back. 
if it is a pillow top, a sealy posturepedic, we want to be comfortable when it comes to carrying the cross of Christ. But there is no comfort carrying a cross. So if you are under the idea, under the impression that to carry a cross means comfort, you are in the wrong place. To carry the cross means that you have the weight of the cross on your shoulders. To carry the cross means that you have this thing buried in your back. Carrying a cross is not comfortable. And yet the Bible tells us and it is acknowledged that Simon of Cyrene is chosen out of the crowd to bear the cross of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, as those who are called Christians, when we bear the name of Christ, then that also means that we are willing to bear his cross. How many are willing to bear the cross of Christ? at the cost of comfort. Not many people are. So, we're gonna look at the soldiers. The soldiers are here. Now the soldiers, they're doing their job. I would like for us to look at the scripture. I'm gonna come out of Matthew chapter 27 because in order to really comprehend what took place near the cross, we're gonna to have to do what the Bible says. Here a little, there a little, what? Line upon line, precept upon precept. You, if you want to be a student of the Bible, let me tell you this. You cannot read a text and then begin to draw conclusions. That's not how the Bible works. If you want to be a student of the Bible, you are to take the Bible and you are to compare the Bible to itself. God is so good when it comes to his word that if you are diligently seeking him, he promises that you will find him. He will make known to you the mysteries of this book. And then you become the scholar of the hour. So the soldiers, we're going to Matthew chapter 27, and we wanna read about the soldiers. Are we there? And it says, starting Matthew 27, looking at verse 27, then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. And they did what? They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted the crown of thorns. They put it on his head and a reed in his right hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying what? Hell, king of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. Are we, are we there? Are we at the same place? So these are the things that they're doing. I want to jump down to verse 35. And it says, then they did what? They crucified him and what else? Divided his garments, casting lines that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. There is a lot of information here. And again, when you look at this, when you look at Matthew, when you look at Mark, when you look at John, there's some information that I would like to give you because I'm just telling you, go back and look at it. I'm all about fact checking. Don't take my word at anything. Please don't because I can always be in error. Make sure that you go back and check what I'm saying. Use God's word. He'll show you. So here are the soldiers, and they're given a task. Their task is to Keep eye on the one who is about to be crucified. We listen, we see here in the text that there's some things going on. That, that, that he's given um, a drink, he's given sour wine to drink that's mingled with gall. That they are gambling over his garments. Yes? They are guarding him. I would like to break this down. So the Bible tells us that Jesus is given sour wine that is mingled with gall. Gaul, that's the English word, and the Greek is kole, which actually means poison. So the way it worked was, in the tradition, as it was customary, when they were about to crucify all victims of crucifixion, they were given this mixture. And what the mixture was supposed to do was help anesthetize them to the pain. It was to help numb them. But when you look at the word gall, knowing that gall actually means poison, it was really to kind of succumb them into an early death so that they would kind of just slip off. 
the scripture tells us that Jesus refuses to take this mixture of sour wine and gall. Why does he refuse to take it? Because he needed to take the full weight of what it was the penalty of sin would be. He did not want to have his senses benumbed at all. He needed to be able to fully declare that he had given everything for humanity. That he felt what it would be like for the sinner who would reject the salvation that was being given to them freely. The Bible tells us that the soldiers are at the foot of Christ and they are gambling over his items. Again, it is customary. This is not some new phenomenon, but that's what happened. According to Roman custom, when there was a person, whatever guards were guarding the person who was being crucified, the law said that you could have their stuff. So whatever they came in with, whatever clothing they had, you were allowed by the law to take their clothing. And so this is what is going on at the foot of the cross, because if you got a nice piece of clothing, I mean, I want it, but you might want it. I want it. Mel might want it, but Pastor, you know, Pam might want it. Pastor, you know, Bray, Bray. We all might go, I want that article. And so the only fair way to get it is to do what? Gamble over it. So here they are. They're gambling over the garments. They get to a particular piece. They get to this particular piece that's a one, this one piece. It's, it's not, it doesn't have a stitch, and so it's full. It's intact. It's like this. And, and the scholars say that the garment they were gambling over is basically what I'm wearing, a prayer shawl, but it was nice. It was a nice prayer shawl. It was a nice talit. And they did not want to cut it up. The other garments, it was okay because they were cut up garments and they would take it as trinkets. They would take it as a trinket to be like, this was the prisoner and I took his whatever. But on this particular piece of garment, they're gambling. They're gambling at the foot of the cross. They were near the cross in missing something while they were there. While they were near the cross, they gambled away opportunities. They were in front of the cross of Jesus. They were near the cross, and yet they missed it. They were seeking the pleasures of the world. How many of us are near the cross, and we're gambling away the opportunities given to us? We're seeking the lavish lifestyle. We're wanting to make sure that we have the things of the world because that's what the soldiers were doing. They're gambling for the things of the world, missing the fact that they are standing in the very presence of God. So again, how many of us, because the truth of the matter is when I look at the 12 who are near the cross, can I tell you honestly, the 12 are also in the church. These 12 that we see, these 12 that we see, oh, thank you. The 12 that we, even louder. <laughs> the 12 that we see near the cross, we see them in the church. So with that said, let's go to our next two. So now the Bible tells us that there are two, that they are two rock. Who what? What are they? Robbers. Now, if your Bible is saying thief, I want to make the correction because I want, I, I want you to understand that it's a reason that they are called robbers. You go, well, why would robbers find themselves being crucified? What could possibly take place that a robber is on a cross to be crucified? Well, let me break this down for you. Do you know that there is a difference between a robber and a thief? How many of you guys are aware that it's a difference between a robber and a thief? See, because thieves, they do things stealthfully. Thieves, they do things without knowing about it. You come back and your purse is gone because a thief took it. You come back because, and your car is gone because a thief took it. But when it comes to robbers, they're a whole nother ball game. See, robbers are intentional about their actions. Robbers are deliberate about what they're doing. Robbers, at the cost of your personal injury and safety, they do not mind taking your stuff if it even comes with your bodily harm. So, these robbers are here on the cross next to Christ, one to the left and one to the right. Some say that the reason that they are on the cross 
is due to the fact that they had a robbery that went bad. They had a robbery that went bad. And this is how they got themselves next to Jesus. Can I point something else out to you? Because I really need you to get the brevity of what the word robbery is really all about. Robbery is so offensive to God that in Malachi chapter 3 verse 8, he says, will a man rob God? Now, we said to rob is a violent and intentional act with the, with the idea to do harm. So if I can, in my mind, really tell you what that says, will a man violently God, will a man willingly, deliberately, violently take something from God? But God says, not only did you violently violate me and take something from me, but you violently took it from the nation as well. There's a difference between a robber and a thief. So much so, that Jesus even brings the point up in his parable about the Good Samaritan. He talks about that this man was on his way. And while he was on his way, he fell among robbers. Not thieves. Not thieves. Robbers. And it says that they took his stuff, they stripped him of what he had, and they departed and left him for dead. This is what robbers do. And so we have these two individuals, these two robbers who find themselves next to Jesus. The Bible tells us, the Bible tells us, here it is on verse 38, then two robbers were crucified with him. You can follow along. The two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Now, as you read down a little bit further, it will talk about these two robbers, how they, 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 um, they in the situation like Jesus and they have the nerve to mock Jesus. They are in the same condition, same position, being crucified with their lives literally hanging between the balance of eternity and damnation. Standing, hanging in the presence the cross of Christ, they don't recognize it, and they have the, the nerve to mock Jesus, and they in the same situation. How does that happen? That's like, Kim, you and I going out, and we end up robbing somebody, and get arrested, and I'm laughing at you that you got your mug shot before I got my mug shot. Like, oh, girl, your mug shot, well... That's, that's a little bit out of my, it's a little crazy. That I'm laughing at you that you got a mugshot and forgetting the fact that I got one too. But they are. They mock Jesus. And so my question today is we look at the 12 who stood near the cross. Who in here is mocking Jesus? Who here is mocking Jesus? The Bible tells us that if you want to go and find this out, these, these robbers are on the cross with Christ for a period of six hours. Luke tells us that the beginning that Christ is crucified at the third hour. He takes his last breath at the ninth hour. Now, I'm not a scholar of math or anything, but I can do that bit of a simple math. math. It's six hours. For the six hours, for six hours, here are these these are these robbers on the cross next to Christ. Something happens with at least one of the robbers. Something happens. I don't know if he's listening and he's watching. And, and, and he's impressed. Does Jesus say, Father, forgive them, for, for they know not what they do? I don't know if, if, if he's touched when he hears the crowd saying he healed others, but he himself, he cannot heal. Impressed by the fact that he is watching Christ's humility as spoken about in Isaiah. 
that says he was led like a lamb to slaughter and silent before his shears. And he said not a mumbling word. I don't know what this thief saw, what this robber saw when it came to Christ, but something stirred inside of him and caused him to say, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. I love the fact that Jesus is dying, but Jesus' love is so grand that he says, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a break out of dying for a moment, and I'm going to deal with somebody's needs. We're in the same position, or so it seems on the surface, but we're not in the same position. See, because I have the power over life and death. And here you are, face this eternal death, and you decision that that's not where you want to be. And so because you have acknowledged who I am and I have the power over life and death, I'm going to give you a guarantee. You, you're going to die today. But believe me when I tell you that's not the end. Believe me when I tell you what them, yeah, you're going to be there too. Somebody needs to hear those words today. You might be looking at a hopeless situation, but I'm here to tell you Jesus, the giver of life, says, I can take your change it. I'll turn it around. I'm able to make it better, and I can give you my promise and my guarantee that where I am, there you'll be also. I need to double back a little bit because this, this, this thing caught my eye. When we're looking at, 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 the, at the soldiers, the Bible tells us, the Bible tells us that in verse 37 of Matthew chapter 27, and they put over his head the accusation written against him. This is Jesus, the king of the Jews. Now, I'm doubling back over this because I thought that this is important that we hear this. Look what it says. They put over his head the accusation written against him. When, that's, that's right. When criminals, the way the, the society worked, that when someone was being crucified, they had to have their name written over their head so that everybody could see who it was and their crime. So I'm going to bring it forward because y'all can understand. How many of y'all get those papers and they, they have the paper where you can go down and see who got arrested for what? Y'all know the paper? Y'all know what I'm talking about? They find they, they at the grocery store and they had a, they had a mug. But you know, the, 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 the brother Jimmy or, or Jim, Jim, Jim Henry, he, he got arrested for armed robbery or stuff, and he's serving excellent. Y'all know the papers, right? So this was basically the precursor to the paper. And so here it is, the Bible tells us that the accusation over Christ's head. Here is my question to you. What are you accusing Christ of? Because we do it, we talk about the soldiers, but the truth of the matter is we have accusations over Jesus' head as well. We accuse him of not stepping in on time. We accuse him of allowing a loved one to pass. We accuse him for our marriages failing. We hurl accusations at Jesus all day and we hang them over his head for the world to see. And this is coming from the people near the cross. The Bible tells us we're going to the group of the, of, the, of the blasphemers. Matthew 27, 39. Matthew 27, 39. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, you who destroyed the temple and build in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Now, the version that we read earlier said in Luke that the blasphemers sneered. Can I just bring, I, I'd like to make the Bible practical. So here were these people, they rolling by, this, they don't even, but they, they, they're not at the cross, they come by the cross just long enough to throw some shade. They stop long enough to throw some shade at Jesus and, and, and to make him feel bad for being what he is. Do you know in the church, blasphemers, and they come by at your ministry long enough to throw shade. 
they tell you about the job that you're not doing or the job that they could be doing better. They stand on our door as our ushers. They sit on our board as our leaders. They sing on our praise team as our praise leaders. And the bottom line is these are the blasphemers that are throwing shade, telling you what you're not doing right. Pointing fingers, saying, mm, 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 look at you. They stop long enough to give you an insult, and then they keep it moving. Then they keep it moving. Blasphemers. Not only were the blasphemers near the cross, and again, what am I saying? When we talk about near the cross, I know you guys are thinking, oh, that's way back when, but I am telling you that we have these same individuals, these same near the cross of Jesus, doing the same things that they did. It's not. The Bible tells us, as we look, look at this, verse 41. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking the scribes, mocking with the scribes and the elders. He saved others. Himself he cannot save. If he is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe him. I don't know if y'all caught that, so I'm going to read it again. It says, likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and elders. Again, I want to bring it forward. The pastor, the the deacons, the religious church leaders roll up near the cross. The people who should have been on Jesus' side are near the cross, and these are the ones who are hurling the insults as well. The religious leaders, the ones who should be near the cross, closest to the cross, are the ones who are giving the insult and the injury. I, I, I just, I don't, they're near the cross. They're near the cross. The leaders, the spiritual leaders near the cross are the ones causing most damage to the church, to the body of Christ. But they near the cross. I want you to hear me real, 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 real good on this one. Being near the cross does not mean or equal being saved. not mean or does it equate to being saved it just means that you're in proximity it just means that you're in proximity but I want us to look real close at this text because you would have missed it you might have missed it I missed it and then the Lord took me back to it and so let's look at the progression again shall we who shows up first with the insults Before the chief priest, before the elders and the scribe, who showed up first? Does the scripture not tell us that it was the blasphemers? Does the scripture not say that the blasphemers are the one who starts with the insults? And right here, likewise, the chief, then, all, the chief priests, the leaders, they join in. Here is the problem. The blasphemers that I would like to call the world influence the spiritual leader. The world influence the spiritual leaders. And as we read a little bit further, the Bible tells us then, after the spiritual leaders begin to mock, guess who all start, starts to mock? The, the, the robbers on the cross. The robbers on the cross. The people who are hanging between life and death, who I like to call the church. So the world influences the spiritual leaders, and the spiritual leaders come back and influence the church. You don't believe me? I'll give you a practical example. So there was once upon a time, Rodin, I don't know if you remember this. I don't know who's been in this church long enough. Do y'all remember a thing called, called choirs? Anybody remember 
the soprano section, the, the, the alto section. Can you remember the alto section? You remember they used to have the tenors in the middle because the, the soprano section was on this side and the altos were on this side and the, and the tenors were in the middle. And if they had a baritone or something, they might be on the back. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And see, what happened, the world influenced the religious leaders. And we went from a place where it was congregational worship. Because choirs were set up that even if you could not sing, you could lend your voice to praise. But they listened to the world. And the world said, let's do away with choirs and let's do this thing called praise team. And let's sit down all the people who can't really sing and the people who might want to sing. And we're going to put the people up there who are the, really the, the stars and we're going to just entertain y'all to death. Am I lying? So the world influenced the spiritual leaders to get rid of this thing where everybody got a chance to blend their voices, to give praise to God, whether you could sing or not. And said, let's sit them down and let's put the best of the best up front. You might be able to sing a little bit, but you, can, can you hear this? Can you hear this note? La, 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 la. Oh, you, you're a little tone deaf. You can't, you can't be on the praise team. La, la, la. Oh, that's a little off. Ooh, mm, maybe next time. Maybe we'll let you sing with, with, when it's children's choir day. And they don't even do that anymore because the children can't sing either. La, 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 la. So the spiritual leaders, the world influences the, the spiritual leaders, and unfortunately, that influenced the church. And so we have churches all over the world that's been affected from the influence of the world. And there are no more choirs where people can lend their voices in praise and harmony to give God what he is due. And he's longing to hear the voices of his people again. I'm just asking a question. I'm sorry. I, I, I stayed there a little too long. Let's, let's go on. <laughs> Let, let's go. The centurion. The centurion. The Bible tells us that there's a centurion who's given the charge to guard Jesus. Now, I need you to understand the role of a centurion. The centurion is not your run-of-the-mill average soldier. Centurion, the very word tells what they are. Centi, meaning is Latin, for 100. This centurion was a Roman soldier who had authority, who had power, who had influence. And this man is guarding the cross. Again, he's near the cross, but he don't know the Christ of the cross. The Bible tells us that the centurion is there. And, I, and again, if you look down, because this one takes you going back and fact-checking me. And so the centurion's story is not just in one, one place. The centurion's story is in several places, in the three Gospels. And it's because of the three Gospels we get a full, complete picture of the centurion. Now, if we were to look, if we were to look at verse 54 of Matthew chapter 27, we'll see that the centurion seems to say something where, oh, well, the centurion is praising God. It says, so when the centurion and those who were with him were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and things that had happened, they greatly feared, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. But then, if you focus on it saying, true, this was the Son of God, have missed the part that said, uh, after these things happened, they greatly. After these things happened, they feared greatly. So now that makes you ask the question, what things happened? 
That's just how my mind works. So I got to go look what happened that this man says, truly this was the son of mine, and that the Bible writer says that it was because of fear. So let's break it down. So we understand Luke says that Jesus is crucified at the third hour. He dies. The Bible tells us that from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, please go back and double check me. Go back. This is your homework for the night. Read the Bible. From the sixth hour to the ninth hour, the Bible says that there was darkness over the land. There's darkness over the land. This man is guarding this man on the cross. There's darkness. Again, in other words, they had a total solar eclipse for three hours. Now, I don't know if y'all know anything about science, but solar eclipses don't last for three hours. If you were here in Nashville, I was so jealous that I couldn't be here in Nashville when it happened. But Pam, you remember telling me about the solar eclipse? How long did that last, you guys? Y'all here in Nashville, how long did that last? Not long. It was almost like a blink of an eye. So I want to paint the picture. The centurion is going, because solar eclipses aren't new. They, they happen every so often. And he's sitting here saying, this solar eclipse should have ended all of two hours and 56 minutes ago. Why is it still dark three hours later? That's one. Number two is, the centurion hears Jesus cry out his last word where he says, Father, into thy hands do I commend my spirit. And with that, and with that, it's right here in the verse, right here, chapter, you know, verse, tw verse 50. And Jesus cried, but this is the part that is not there, which means that you're going to have to go back and verify what I'm saying. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked. And the rocks were split, and the graves were open. Now, I got to tell you right now, I know it reads like right now when Jesus died and made these words that it says that the earthquake and the rocks split and graves were open. I need to go ahead and let you know that the graves were not open at that point. The graves do not open until after the resurrection of Christ. So I know it reads this way, but again, this is when you have to go back and study. It appears that they go, oh, Jesus died, the earthquake, and then what? is dying, dead people are walking around the city. No. No, it didn't happen like that. Jesus dies, there's an earthquake, Jesus is buried. Three days later, he rises, when he rises, there's another earthquake. And that earthquake is the earthquake that shakes the graves and calls the righteous to come up out of the graves. But I need to, to understand what's going on. So, there's a three-hour solar eclipse. There's now an earthquake that has taken place after this man has said, Father, I, into your hands I commend my spirit. That is why the scripture tells us it is because of fear that the centurion makes this statement. Truly, this was the Son of God. I got to bring it forward. How many, when Jesus comes through the crowds, and the clouds roll back, that they too will make the declaration that truly this is the Son of God. But they will not be making that declaration out of faith, but out of fear. The Bible tells us that in Revelation, they're going to ask that the rocks would fall on them. You have the opportunity right now to say, I don't want to be in that group. You don't have to put Jesus out of fear. You don't have to acknowledge who he is out of fear. He is beckoning you right now today. Come and get to know me as I am. I'm a peacemaker. I'm a lover. I'm one who wants your best interest always. See, because when you fall in love with that Jesus, you don't have the idea of this fearful, vengeful God that's trying to destroy you because you are in relationship with him. I'll say it again. See, what does it talk about? Perfect love casts out fear. It is when you are not in relationship, when you're not in the right relationship with him, that you become fearful. But when I'm in right standing with him, when I'm in the right relationship with him, I don't fear. I know he has my back. We're almost there. And it tells us, 
all of his acquaintances, all of his acquaintances. I'm going to go, it says in 55, and many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were looking on from afar. Now, Luke gives it the account calling them the acquaintances, that there was acquaintances that followed. And, and when I looked at the word acquaintances, I wanted you to understand, what is an acquaintance? I, 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 thank y'all. I appreciate that. Cause everybody, else. what is an acquaintance? Do we know? A, an acquaintance is somebody you you don't really know. You know them casual. You you know of them. You might know their name. You might even know they work in. If you might know who is, but you don't know them. And so the Bible tells us that here are some acquaintances of Christ that they are following him into the city. They follow him into the place where he's being crucified. And they, again, don't know him. They're an acquaintance. I really want to find the scripture. Oh, it's Luke 23, 27. So I want to give it to you so that you go back and fact. Luke 23, 27. This is what it says. And a great multitude of people follow him. And here's verse 49. All of his acquaintances... And the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. Again, we're talking about near the cross. But we just heard that they were at a distance. That they, they weren't near the cross. They were at a distance. There are people who come into the sanctuary. And you position yourselves that... We are near the cross when my mind, when my thoughts, when what I'm thinking about, what I'm doing after I leave here, what I'm eating on Sabbath afternoon for dinner. When, when those thoughts aren't here, I might be in the building, but I'm afar off. I'm watching at a distance. And so we're looking at the acquaintances that the Bible mentions happen to be there. And again, we said that acquaintances... They are familiar with you, but they don't know you. And so here are the people who have heard about the miracles of Jesus. They, they have followed him. They know about him. They've heard people talk about him, but they don't know him. And then in the same group, it tells us that there were women that followed him from Galilee. So if I can put that in layman's terms, these folk followed him from the beginning of his ministry. They follow him from the beginning. So you got the group that they don't really know him, and you have the folk who follow him from the beginning. I want to read a statement from Ellen White. It comes out of Desire Age. It is, it is chapter 78. The chapter is called Calvary, page 743. And this is what Ellen White says. Of the multitude that followed the Savior to Calvary, many had attended him with joyful hosannas and waving of palm branches as he rode triumphantly into Jerusalem. But not a few who had then showed his praise because of the pop, it was the, here it is, because it was the popular thing to do, now swelled the cry of crucify him, crucify him. When Christ rode into Jerusalem, the hopes of the disciples had been raised to the highest pitch. They had pressed close about their master, feeling that it was a high honor to be connected with him. Now, in his humiliation, they followed him at a distance. They were filled with grief and bowed down with disappointed hopes. How many of us have started with Christ from the beginning? And then something went wrong in our lives. And we pull back, follow him. From the beginning, then grief, and we begin to pull back. We, we, we step back. Everyone that we caught ourselves following. Down here with Mary, the mother of Christ. We'll be done in Guys, book of John. Can you go to the book of John? 
We're going to read John's account of who was there. Reading in verse 25, John 19, verse 25. And we'll read to 27. Are you there? I'll say it slowly again. John chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. And I love, now there stood by the cross of Christ. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her, took her to his own home. Again, it says, now there stood by the cross of Jesus. And it gives a listing of those who stood by the cross, not near it. I'll say it again. They stood by the cross, not near it. It says that Mary, the mother of Jesus, is the first one listed. And you would think that a mother would naturally be there with her child as they are being tormented. But let's just be honest. We have mothers who, they, they aren't there like that. We have mothers that, that do not care for their kids like that. But here is mother. Here. And she is by the cross. By it. Why is she there? It's not just because she carried her, carried Jesus in her womb. She carried him in her spirit. Jesus in their spirit, which causes us to stand by the cross. And then we see Mary Magdalene. Why is Mary Magdalene standing by the cross? Because Mary understood the mag which her sins were forgiven. See, when you understand what Jesus has done for you, you stand by the cross of Jesus. You don't run away. You stand there firm. Mary understood that when she washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair, remember the, the whole scenario is that Simon is not understanding why Jesus is even touching her. And Jesus says to Simon, you don't understand because, see, you love little. But this woman, because she loved much, that is why she's doing that. See, when you love much, when you love Jesus with all your heart, you stand by the cross. You don't let friends influence you to leave the cross. You don't let relationships break you to make you leave the cross. You stand by Jesus no matter the cost. Which now brings us to John. See, the Bible tells us, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom Jesus loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. When we're talking about those who stand by the cross, the first thing that you need to understand about this disciple, that when you are a disciple of Christ who stands by the cross, you do not insert yourself into the story. John is the writer of this book. And when he makes reference about the disciple, he's talking about himself. But he does not brag about it. See, when you love Christ, you don't brag about what you do. You don't insert your story. You just do it. You just, because you love Jesus. And I don't need attention from the world. Look, Jesus then entrusts John with the most precious thing that he had, his mother. When you stand by the cross of Christ, you will take care of the things that are most precious to Jesus. When you stand by, I'll say it again, when you stand by, when you are a disciple, a real disciple who stands by the cross of Jesus, you take care of Margaret the things that are most precious to Jesus. Here's something that's interesting. Because I, I, I looked at this thing and I had to step back and I had to ask some questions. Jesus 
the Bible tells us that Jesus had other siblings. But when you look here, guess who's not there? Guess who's not listed? They are not mentioned. Any of the Gospels is being present at the cross. Is this why Jesus turns to John and says, take care of my mother? Because I can't trust my family to do it? Just, just a thought. You take care of the things that are most precious to Jesus when you stand by the cross of Christ. And our final person. Our final number 12 who was near the cross. The person who was near the cross in our order was Joseph Matthias. Joseph of Arimathea, John 38. After this, Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of Jesus, and listen to what is said about him next. But secretly, for fear of the Jews, Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple of Christ, but secretly for fear of the Jews. My question is, how many of us... Mike went out on that, I'll say it again. How many of us are closet Christians? That we worship Jesus when we are around people like us, but when we get around people who don't, who talk against Jesus, we change our tune as well. We're afraid. That's what the scripture is right there in black and white. He was a disciple in the closet, in the dark, because he was afraid of what people would say if they knew that he was an open disciple. We've got to know the question that I have to ask you is which one of the 12 are you? The reality is, is when I read this, I saw myself. I saw myself in the 12. And I touched on probably every single one of them. There have been moments when I have been fearful and I have not told people who I really am. Because sometimes it's hard being a seven-day Adventist. Can I just be honest with you? Because we have to explain why we don't do things on the Saturday. When all the world is doing these things on the Saturday. And we go, I'm a Sabbath keeper. What? I'm a Sabbath keeper. You're what? I keep the Sabbath. What does that mean? Well, you know, you know, we we we, we keep the seventh day. We don't uh, we don't do we we don't go to the mall and we don't uh, we don't do certain things and I just I go to ch You do what? I go to church on the Sabbath. You go where? You go to church. I go to church. You go against the world, but the world goes to church on Sunday. But we become fearful to tell people who we are because we don't want to be judged. I get it. I get it. That's me. I'll make confession. Confess. So my question comes back, and I'm done. Which one of the 12 are you? One thing that I know that I've been taught and I've been told that there is never a moment invite someone to take a stand, to make a decision, to come down. Now watch. I'm not asking you to come down the aisle and, and get baptized. Now here's the thing. If throughout what you heard today, the Spirit of God has moved on you and said you need to make some changes, you see yourself as one of the two of the thieves, then by all means, do what only God, do what God do. But if I sometimes, I act like Joseph of Arimathea and I don't always tell people because I'm fearful. Then I invite you to make a decision to say, I want to do better. If you are like oh, one who was acquainted with Christ or one who followed from the beginning and you go, I know about him. I've heard of his miracles, but I'm not in relationship to him. I invite you today to get to know him. And so, we'll do this as I've seen before. I'm going to ask everybody to stand. And the way this works, 
I saw this once and I thought, man, that's genius. If you go, I heard about the 12, but really there was nothing in there that applied to me. Go ahead and sit down right now. If you listen to the 12 and you said, well, that's not me, and 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 that's not me. And you got all the way down the list of the 12, and you go, I don't see myself anywhere on the list. I give you permission to sit down right now. And guess what? Nobody's going to look at you funny because I said it from the front. Go ahead and sit down right now. But if you saw yourself somewhere among the 12, and you know in your heart and in your spirit there's some things that you need to make right with God, then I say thank you to God be the glory. In your heart, go ahead and make the confession with Jesus. Or make your way forward. I'm going to invite Elder Bray to come and pray. Because I will raise my hand to say that I am one of the twelve. And not necessarily always the one who stands by the cross. There are moments that I am near it. I want to be by the cross of Jesus. How about you? This morning, if you're in the same spirit and you saw yourself going to vibe if you're in the same Weary. Come on down for prayer. That's you. If you're watching us online, communicate with us. Prayer at South Nashville, SDA. Prayer at South Nashville, SDA. Pray for you. We're not in the hurry this morning. We're already at the time, so let's go. We're waiting on you. Let's pray together. Kim, I saw a little bit of myself in all of them. Come on, let's get, can we be real? Can we be naked before God? But the wonderful thing about God is that he still loves us. And he still gives us another chance. And he still wants to do something special for us and in us. We're waiting for you. We're not going to wait long. That's you. Get up out of your seat and come on down. Let's pray together. If you're watching this online, you can write in the chat. That's you. You're talking to me today, Pastor Kia. We be honored to minister to you and serve you. Prayer. Prayer at South Nashville SDA.org. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today word that you sold into our hearts and sold into our minds. God, we, we see ourselves not near the cross, but all around the cross like the others. But God, you promised that you would do something for us, that you would do something special. You love us so much that you see us as we are, but you love us so much to not leave us where we are. So do something today for us. God, we come to the foot of the cross and we just simply say we need you we need you so do what you promised that you would do deliver us set us free where we we make us strong build us up help us to be what you call us to be now God I pray for each person that's come to the altar. God you know their need you know which one applies to them. Or even a couple of them apply to them. God, use us. Touch. Deliver. Heal. Set free. Make whole. God, we hold on to your hands. And in, even in our weakness, we won't let you go. Until you bless us. Bless us now. In Jesus' name. We pray. Amen.
God bless you this morning. Bless your decision. the Lord a hand clap for praise of what God did in this place for us today. Sit servant. Can I say that? <laughs> That's 12 servant. One servant. Because you can get the spirit every last one of them. Well, I'm glad you're blessed today that God did something special for you. We want to remind you at 5 o'clock we have deeper. It's going to be good today. <laughs> so you don't want to miss it. 5 o'clock. Deeper's going to be good today. Let's stand to be dismissed. Our friends that are joining us online, we're so glad that you tuned in today. We know you are blessed by the word that God did something for you today. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Hopefully in the sanctuary, but if not, online. We look forward to having you be part of the church family. So let's pray a benediction for you today. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you for what you did today. What are we to as we leave this place for never your presence? Now, in the day, to join us today. We look forward to seeing you next And until then, the Lord bless you and keep you. This is prayer. Show the